evening all. Thank you so much for coming despite this absolutely dreadful weather, <laughs> which I barely survived myself. Um, it's such a pleasure to be in Ithaca. I came here very shortly after I first moved to the US, very briefly because I had friends studying here. And I've always wanted to come back. And Raza Ruby very kindly gave me the opportunity to come. So I thank him uh, and uh, it's really an honor uh, to be here speaking with all of you. So of course the title of this talk, rather ambitiously, was The Crisis of the Media Industrial Complex. So, but before I begin to address the state of the mainstream media as I see it, I'd like to explain why media representations are so important, so determining generally, but especially so here in the United States. What happens here, what decisions are taken or not taken, what policies are made and unmade, and whether and how they are represented, all this has extremely wide-ranging effects far beyond the borders of this country. We live in the most powerful nation in the world. This fact is echoed repeatedly in the media, of course, but only as a source of infinite pride, if not hubris. Scarcely a word is spoken about its most injurious effects. The US has a military footprint, in some cases small, in some cases enormous, in over 150 countries. The US spends exponentially more on the military than the next several countries combined. It remains the determining voice and presence in extremely powerful multilateral institutions, including NATO, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, to name only a few of the most prominent whose decisions massively impact levels of security, poverty, health, in fact, of the very fact of life and death for all the peoples of the world, most notably and perceptibly the most vulnerable, those in the global south. And this remains true irrespective of the current president's repeated dismissals, threats, and accusations that multilateralism dilutes American power or exploits its putative generosity. What is the role of the media here in making plain the less honorable actions such power enables? It's hard not to think of George Bernard Shaw's claim about newspapers, which he made, of course, in the early 20th century, but this claim about newspapers applies equally, if not exponentially, to television media, <coughs> to say nothing of social media. Shaw wrote, quote, newspapers seem unable to discriminate between a bicycle accident and the collapse of civilization. <laughs> this scathing indictment is especially damning now, given the ubiquitous presence of the media and its increasing intimacy with state power. The media's failure to convey the broader structures within which American policy is formulated and enacted the facts and effects of these policies essentially means the media itself is critical to maintaining this power and its unfortunate corollary, impunity. Some may still view the media as distinct from the state and distinct <coughs> from the market, but it should be abundantly clear that it's deeply implicated in both. Worse still, we are now confronted with the mass and continually multiplying phenomena of social media, which, despite its many redeeming qualities, has also created the horrors with which we are now all too familiar, especially under the present political dispensation. Social media has exploded all over the planet, providing a means for everybody to reflexively broadcast whatever comes to mind. 
although one hesitates to call it thought. <laughs> <laughs> and so now, more than ever, we're assaulted by a relentless flow of information, images, and more than anything, impulsive and sadly often fatuous opinions. And it's all but impossible to distinguish the real from the imaginary, truthfulness from mendacity. As an effect or a cause, it's difficult to say. But in any case, the present occupant of the White House is among the most exemplary models of the damages of this phenomenon, and certainly its most public and powerful representative. So it is now through this and other media that we bear witness to the ever multiplying forms of atrociousness around us, often from the horse's mouth, as it were. Trump's antics, which would simply be ludicrous if they weren't so perverse, so ruthless, so devastating for hundreds of millions of people across the world. And here, some dominant media have started in part to fulfill their function that is, holding the state to account, or more accurately, attempting to hold the Trump administration to account. But given how transparently morally compromised this administration is, we can't be too overjoyed by this sudden awakening on their part. It also begs the question, what was the media up to before? And also, of course, what omissions and distortions remain. I'll just be briefly go through a few, and the infinite others I don't mention, we can turn to during the discussion when I'll also talk about the way Democracy Now! has addressed uh, uh, these issues. So the first is inequality. There exists today, as a universal condition, the unprecedented concentration of wealth and means in the hands of the few, together with, perhaps even predicated on, the radical and increasing dispossession of the rest, whose vastness of scale, intensity, and relentlessness would once have made it unthinkable, except in the realm of dystopian literary fantasy. This parallel or maybe constitutive world of brutal inequality, both within and across national boundaries, is made all too clear by the figures Oxfam repeatedly, if ineffectually, produces every year. The richest 1% of the world's population now has as much wealth as the rest of the world combined and only 26 individuals own the same amount as 3.8 billion of the world's poorest people. Last year, in one year alone, billionaires saw their wealth increase by $900 billion. That's $2.5 billion a day. 82% of the new wealth generated went to the top 1%, while 0% has gone to the world's poorest. It scarcely merits pointing out that the handful who are the beneficiaries of this order have everything to do with its perpetuation. The vast majorities remain its victims. Where is the media in all of this? As we all know, nary a word was spoken about this inequality before Bernie Sanders became a prominent national figure. Only then did the media begin taking marginal note of this. Mm -hmm. To cite only the most obvious example, during Occupy Wall Street, the media maintained near universal silence on the message being conveyed out of Zuccotti Park mm -hmm. and often displayed only barely veiled contempt for the protesters. Despite this, and this is a credit to those protesters, it was these very protests that popularized the fact of the 1%. Mm -hmm. The second issue, America's global role. Sorry, this is all going to be rather, rather schematic because we'll deal with it when we talk about it. 
and I could go over each one for like 45 minutes and bore everyone to death. <laughs> America's global role. <clears throat> it's remarkable that many in both the so-called liberal and conservative media have lamented Trump's presidential tenure, not for the suffering his policies have induced the world over, which certainly they have, but rather for the loss of a decades-long consensus between both parties on American foreign policy. That is, what's always unified Democrats and Republicans is the shared interest in maintaining, projecting, strengthening, and expanding US power. A consensus widely affirmed in the media then, and now at times celebrated and recalled with great nostalgia as both benevolent and emancipatory. Take, for instance, Paul Krugman. For 70 years, he writes in the New York Times, for 70 years, American goodness and American greatness went hand in hand. Our ideals and the fact that other countries knew we held those ideals made us a different kind of great power, one that inspired trust, Krugman concludes. This rather sentimental assessment from the New York Times columnist seems to run counter to the long-held practice of the US instigating or supporting illegal wars, assassinations, coups, death squads, and lethal blockades and sanctions. Mm -hmm. So perhaps one ought to ask the people of Iran, Chile, Vietnam, Nicaragua, Argentina, or Iraq, to name only a few, if they share this perspective on American goodness and trustworthiness. <laughs> On the question of the U.S. military's presence and actions abroad, of course, the U.S. media has played an especially shameful role. The examples are legion, but I'll cite only one of the most egregious in recent memory. In April last year, Trump ordered military strikes on a Syrian airbase, a strike which was celebrated in the most extraordinary way in the media with CNN's Farid Zakaria declaring that Trump became president that day, and MSNBC's Brian Williams gushing over what he termed the, quote, beautiful pictures of the strikes, quoting none other than Leonard Cohen. <laughs> I'm guided by the beauty of our weapons, Brian Williams repeated. Wow. <laughs> what is one to conclude from this? Nothing seems to excite the mainstream media more than totally gratuitous and utterly devastating military bombardment led by any and all occupants of the White House. The news then only conveys this perverse excitement with a corresponding blindness to the ruin and devastation left in its wake. Third. <clears throat> the death of a reporter and Yemen. As some of you probably know, yesterday marked one year since the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi was brutally murdered by the kingdom. The media's obsession last year with his gruesome murder and dismemberment did indeed appear curious to some who wondered why it took this one murder horrific as it was, for some to finally start evincing something like the same horror at the mass killing, starvation, and destruction wrought by the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen, a war waged with US weapons and intelligence which began well before Trump in March 2015. <coughs> Just before the Khashoggi affair, the US media's enthusiastic embrace of Mohammed bin Salman the crown prince and the very architect of that same war, the media's enthusiastic embrace was nothing short of indecent, virtually bordering on delirium, with the New York Times's Thomas Friedman possibly, if unsurprisingly, the worst offender. And this is to say nothing about the well-documented fact that Saudi Arabia has long been among the most repressive regimes on the planet, 
has nevertheless for decades remained one of the staunchest allies of the US and an enthusiastic patron of its weapons industry, a fact that Trump has made embarrassingly transparent on a number of occasions, but especially last year when he looked bewildered and mildly petulant that he might be expected to relinquish $110 billion in arms sales to the kingdom because of the disappeared journalist. As one astute observer remarked, quote, the extensive moral squalor this crown prince has presided over is far from exceptional in Saudi history, and neither was his impulse in the Khashoggi case to exterminate him and mutilate his corpse. And just as a reminder, Yemen, this tiny country, was already the poorest in the Arab world before the Saudi assault began, and now lies entirely in ruins. The war has killed tens of thousands since 2015 when it began, and has caused the death by starvation of an estimated 85,000 children. U.S. involvement, though not highlighted <coughs> in the media here, has not gone unnoticed elsewhere. UN investigators said last month that the US, together with Britain and France, may be complicit in war crimes because they armed the coalition that's led this bombing campaign. But till the murder of one of its own, of course, horrific in every sense, the US media seemed not terrifically bothered by the deaths of thousands in an unjust war waged by an American ally with critical U.S. support. Fourth, U.S. election news coverage. More immediately, for our moment, there is the looming specter, or hope, depending on one's perspective, of the 2020 presidential elections. Where does the media hear? If the last presidential election is to be any guide, let me read a few figures. The Tyndall Report analyzed major network campaign coverage in 2015, that is, the year prior to the elections. The report found that in over 1,000 minutes of national broadcast television airtime devoted to all the campaigns, 1,000 minutes, Trump received 327 minutes, while Bernie Sanders was granted all of 20 minutes. Hillary Clinton got 121 minutes. That's six times the amount Sanders received, but still much less than what Trump received. ABC World News Tonight aired 81 minutes of reports on Trump, compared with just 20 seconds on Bernie Sanders. Apart from this reprehensible asymmetry, there is, of course, the shocking amount of money that goes into this very minimal exercise of democratic rights. Election day is still more than a year away, but media companies are already anticipating massive profits through advertising. One prominent ad agency estimates spending for political ads will reach $10 billion dollars, an increase of almost 60% from the 2016 election year, an election that was by far already the most expensive in history anywhere. Apart from its own terrible role in distorting the electoral process, how much has the dominant media done to reveal the very troubling financial structure that underpins the entire electoral process here. Not a lot, I'm afraid. The Russia investigation, last. We've all heard endlessly about the Russia investigation. <coughs> Whatever one's views of the investigation, its endless intricacies and conclusions and speculations, What's been especially striking to me in all this coverage is the extent to which American commentators, from the media to the academy to policymakers, 
have repeatedly exhibited a kind of injury, as if they've been violated and betrayed in the most terrible way. At a recent lecture I attended, I heard an Ivy League historian and media commentator proclaiming US innocence almost as if childlike, saying that prior to 2016, the US didn't understand the way its election system works, how vulnerable it is. And in 2016, the Russians, quote, showed us how vulnerable we are. How is one to understand this quite sincere posture of innocence? Is the US really, in its own view, so untainted, so naive? Isn't it, in fact, the case that the US has not only interfered in elections all over the world, but has actively carried out or enabled actual assassinations of candidates, not to mention deposing democratic elected leaders that worked counter to US interests, etc. Where in the media has there been any word on this? Two wrongs don't make a right, of course, as everyone agrees, but surely it's a bit disingenuous for one of the perpetrators of those wrongs to claim such absolute virtue, and even rather audaciously, it must be said, naivete. On what is this naivete predicated, if not on the very failures of the media? There is an added complexity to this, the Russia investigation. What is one to make of this sense that the present administration has been brought into office by an especially malign and unprecedented intrusion the likes of which the US has never witnessed, much less participated in. Isn't it a little too self-exonerating to believe that Trump is the consequence <laughs> of a foreign villain rather than simply an organic American phenomenon? Why would the media have us believe that? And where do we expect or fear it might lead us? Thank you. Uh, most illuminating and uh, certainly you raised a host of issues which I'm sure the audience uh, uh, would like to follow up uh, through questions and comments. So I think in the interest of time, I'll skip my questions, Nat and uh, okay. all our great uh, participants and attendees. So <clears throat> here's a question, yeah, please. Assuming they have questions. Yeah. Please. Hi, thank you for introducing me. Um, please do introduce yourself if you... <coughs> <coughs> My name is Naveen Sadek. I used to do um, the World Music Show on the CB here. We can't and hear you. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, so... <laughs> I, I, I get in trouble for yelling, so I have to say anything louder. But I'm actually... Um, I'm curious why we're focusing so much on Saudi Arabia. Um, as a Muslim, I feel like, I hope Saudi Arabia is divinely protected because I would hate to see our country bombing uh, holy sites that, um, you know, I think that's, uh, in my opinion, I think that country is divinely protected. And in fact, we drive our cars with that, their oil. So I, uh, th that's just something I wanted to bring up. But I also am curious, um, if you watch Tucker Carlson tonight, I, I enjoy seeing Glenn Greenwald on there frequently, and I'm just curious what you think about the libertarian or sort of the silent majority in America and how they're suffering um, with, you know, just the, the topics that Tucker Carlson brings up, like um, the drug epidemic and how China is <coughs> is being implicated in a lot of the drugs that are being sent, fentanyl being sent to this country, and how China has um, these, these re-education re camps for Muslims, and why is the liberal left, the liberals and the progressives in America not interested in holding China accountable, and so focused on Arabs? Very good. <laughs> okay, so I'll answer these yes. and then yeah. turn to others. So first of all, okay, I'm sorry, I don't by any means hope to suggest or even imply in the faintest way 
that what the U.S. should be doing is attacking Saudi Arabia. I mean, absolutely, absolutely, under no circumstances, no. Uh, that, that is not at all uh, the point that I was trying uh, to make. It's rather that um, Saudi Arabia is, uh, however one perceives it, and of course its significance for over a billion people in the world cannot be underestimated. Uh, it's unfortunate that those sites are now under the rule of this absolutely ruinous uh, royal family. Uh, but the point was not at all to suggest that what the Americans or what anyone should do is wage a war on Saudi Arabia. It's only to point out that uh, Saudi Arabia is an extremely powerful country, uh, regionally as well as globally. It has been responsible for all kinds of outrageous behavior internally and externally. It is an extremely close ally of the U.S. for all kinds of reasons, not only having to do with oil. Uh, and that this fact receives much less attention than, say, for example, uh, the evils and depredations of Iran or Syria or, I don't know, your take a number of other Muslim countries, in fact. And of course, it's not to say that they're all wonderful and Saudi Arabia is terrible. That's not it. It's that if one is going to take a principled, if one wants at least minimally the media, okay, forget the American state, the media should represent as accurately and truthfully as possible, untouched by the interests of the State Department or whatever corporation happens to be advertising on their channel, etc., to represent as accurately as possible, as they say, the facts of the case. Right. So that goes should go for Saudi Arabia as much as it goes for Iran. Uh, so that's the the first thing on Saudi Arabia. As far as Glenn Greenwald and Tucker Carlson and so on. Um, you know, Glenn is often on, I don't know if you are watch Democracy, Glenn Greenwald is often on our show. Um, there has been some uh, discussion about whether, you know, people should go on shows uh, on, like, like Tucker Carlson because, uh, not because it's a, a conservative show or a right-wing show, but because he has people on the show routinely who exhibit so uh, transparently, often racist, um, exclusionary, sexist, etc. remarks. Um, but I think it's very good, uh, you know, that people should engage with whoever the audiences are. That, and I also think, I mean, quite apart from that, that it is a massive problem. That that a part of the distortion here with the liberal media on this Russia thing is that it it totally erases the fact of the people who voted for Trump <laughs> and the reasons they voted for Trump, what you call the, the, the silent majority. And it's a massive problem. And the fact that you're absolutely correct that the main victims of this opioid epidemic are precisely poor white communities. It's not only poor white communities, but they are by far the majority. And it's a, it's a huge problem. I agree with you that this is something to which, um, how should I say, it's not I guess because the scales are so, one is constantly trying to accommodate uh, different vulnerable populations. Uh, not everyone gets the kind of representation they deserve. I, I do think it's very important to talk about these people. I don't think uh, that the present discussion about Russiagate or about Trump's absurd behavior all the time, I don't think any of that enables us to address what is actually going on amongst the communities that voted for him. Which is also, of course, not to pathologize everyone who voted for Trump. It's rather to say that there are objective conditions under which they live that allowed them to feel whatever they feel uh, 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 towards uh, uh, the president. Those conditions need to be understood. They need to be dealt with. Um, and, and it's true that there is massive obfuscation happening all over the place. As far as China is concerned, I, think I agree with you there as well. China is implicated in all kinds of terrible things. It's an absolutely horrific regime, what they've done in Xinjiang, of course, to Muslims. Um, but also, we've just seen, I mean, Hong Kong, God only knows how this is going to go. Um, yeah, I mean, I, but, but the question about China was that 
people don't want yeah, to I, fault yeah, China nobody's, for. Nobody's talking. People are so focused on Arabs and not focused on China. And oh, I, I see. I find it. I find well, it you know, well, as an Arab and as watching what's happened to the Middle East. I feel like we need to be focusing on China. I think that is our biggest threat if we are going to deploy our military. No, but listen, the point is not that it has to, it's like, you know, you have to, like, uh, bomb someplace, so please let's just bomb China. No, that's not the point. But it's, I mean, just talking about no, I know, but even again, like, I mean, uh, every liberal I know hates Saudi Arabia, and, and I, I don't think they should. I think Saudi Arabia is a wonderful place. It's got animals, it's got holy sites, it's got Muslims. We shouldn't hate Saudi Arabia. We should hate China, is what I'm saying. I think okay, no, but can I, just, can I just say something? I, but, but it's not like, it's like saying, um, I mean, I don't think anyone should hate America. Well, right. you do. <laughs> no, I don't, actually, not at all. Absolutely not. I've lived here for over 15 years, not at all. And I'm sorry if my remarks suggested that. What I think we need to do is be critical of states, which is very different from being critical of peoples, cultures, religions. <laughs> Are made of people and when we build I, I think we'll have to uh, end this because there are other questions too. So, yeah. Yes, right at the Hi. end. Hi, I'm Thomas. I'm a film student here at IC. And a recent report came out that said um, baby boomers or people over the age of 65 share seven times more fake news or in inaccurate articles than young people, and I think a lot of the attitudes of older generations right now don't want to listen to young people, and a lot of the attitudes of young people right now is all we have to do is wait for the boomers to die and everything What I'm asking is, do you have, do you have any strategies that young people can use to reach older generations and try to breach that ageism gap rather than both sides just stalemating until time has its way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure that I, I see this. I mean, to me, I think that young people, um, what, what are the what are millennials when they were born after 2000? Are those millennials? Uh, Sorry. Sorry. They grew up in the 2000s. <laughs> oh, look at that. So when the hell are they baby boomers? <laughs> uh, they're, they're calling it, the casual thing is if you remember 9-11, you're a millennial. If you were born so that where you can't, you're a Gen Z, because that's like the cultural touch the moment. I see, I see. Okay, so I don't know, whatever the, these pe the, the, the young people now who have done uh, the, the marches on gun violence is extraordinary. I mean, it's amazing. And I, and I don't know the, the older people uh, you're uh, refer well, whatever this, the demographic is that you're referring to. <laughs> yeah, that, that uh, I don't know, people have extraordinary uh, respect for what the Parkland students did and how they managed to elevate this. Now, God knows what will come of it but they really uh, elevated the conversation on gun control to a level that has never before been seen. Uh, so, uh, and that was entirely exclusively led by teenagers. And of course, most recently, we had here in the US the visit of Greta Thunberg, who is all of 16 years old and has in this the single, this, I mean, not to be, but you know, she's like this tiny little girl. I mean, it's unbelievable. She went, and you see this picture of her sitting outside the Swedish parliament with one poster. She's all by herself, this just last year. And look at what she's done. I mean, the whole world, there were people who were on climate strikes from Pakistan to Nigeria to the US, Sweden, England. From, it's unbelievable. These are all young people. I don't know. I don't know older generation people who aren't taken with this. And in fact, not just taken, they're full of admiration. And if anything, self-hatred. It's like, what the hell are we doing? <laughs> okay, so, um, Adelaide, uh, no, sorry. <laughs> Mary. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm so grateful that you're here with us. Oh, thank you. I'm so grateful you're here with me. <laughs> 
Um, well, this, I wanted to say, first of all, thank you for your coverage of Democracy Now!'s coverage of the Kings Bay Plowshares disarming oh, yes. of the Trident submarine. Mm -hmm. As my sister Claire would say, the capstone of American imperialism and um, white supremacy, because that is, the, as she describes it, it's the cock drum that's being held to the head of the planet. So, um, so thank you for that. And you just brought up Greta, and uh, I wanted to ask if you could speak about how U.S. war making goes hand in hand and actually is the number one footprint of uh, global carbo carbon footprint on the globe. Uh, you know, the war making, the war machine, the missiles, the planes, everything. How it feeds into that. If you could comment on that. Um, if you could take maybe one more question okay. and then okay. sort of club them together. So you had a question, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, Introduce yourself as well. I'm Jess. Uh, I'm a junior at IC. Um, so you talk about wealth inequality, and I just wanted to hear your thoughts on. So Andrew Yang's universal basic income give everyone 18 years or older, thousand dollars a month. You'd think that that would get a lot of traction. Like you're giving out free money to people. Um, so I want to hear your thoughts on why you know you aren't seeing a rise in popularity of that idea, or more enthusiasm by like, the American public. Okay, maybe take two first. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you so much uh, for that question. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's massive. Uh, of course, I can't remember numbers. I just have to write everything down to okay. save my life. But we did do, in fact, a segment. We talked about uh, that the US military is, in fact, by far, by exponential orders of I don't know how much, um, responsible for uh, the greatest, as an institution, um, the largest amount of emissions um, are from the U.S. Of all institutions in the world, it is the one. So absolutely, I mean, as if there weren't enough reasons <laughs> to cut military spending, not wage census wars, da 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 da. On top of which, now it seems that even if the wars don't destroy us, the planet will be destroyed by the making of things that could destroy us through war. I mean, it's like completely, you know. Um, so yes, I mean, it's a complete... I don't know, but at the same time, I, and I think Greta is absolutely, you know, I don't know if you guys saw we had her in the studio. We were all completely enraptured by her. She's such an extraordinary person. Um, but she also, you know, she, she, she has all of this, which, you know, I think is very difficult to do. She has this absolutely unshakable commitment. So it's unclear, will anything actually happen? What our government's going to do? What's required? The numbers seem so enormous. The will seems virtually zero, etc. But nevertheless, she, you know, she, she goes on. So of course the military is you know, massively egregious in this. And of course, it's not just the military in the US. It's whatever, all the big militaries in the world, and even the smaller ones. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's, the thing that I wish is that people who are close to Greta and all spokespersons could speak about the interconnectedness, that we will not end the climate crisis without ending war. Mm. That those absolutely. Have yeah, to be absolutely. Coupled. And so can we yeah. get her in the studio again? <laughs> well, I don't remember. To be honest, no, I don't think we, we covered that with her. But look, she didn't even take a plane to come here. I know. Can you imagine what she'd have to no, say about the military. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the other one. Like, and it's now like, you know, whatever we say, so don't tell Greta we did this. And then the question about inequality and at Andrew Yang, universal basic income. You know, the thing is, I have to confess. In my second year of university, I enrolled in an economics class. Oh. And in the first quarter of that semester, I dropped out of my economics <laughs> <laughs> Because I don't understand, like, look, I mean, that sounds like a great idea, $1,000 a month from the time that you're 18 onwards. Yeah, I think that's fabulous. But I don't know why other people, are people not going, I think Bernie Sanders, everybody seems to think he has, I mean, for people who are 
that way inclined, or I should say that way inclined. Um, <laughs> Bernie Sanders seems more plausible. His plan seems more realist. I don't know, realist, I mean, what do I know? Seems there's something about that he knows something that Andrew Yang doesn't know. But I, I, I don't know. What do you think? Um, I think it has more to do with the fact that people don't really have an issue with getting $1,000 a month. It's of more. Course, yeah. It's more an issue with this ideological, like just anxiety about what it means to earn money in the U.S. What it means to make money. A lot of people put their entire identity in their work and how much money. Right. They're so yeah, like that's American meritocracy. Mm -hmm. So when right. I think people see other people and themselves getting free money, it it it's revealing this. Anxiety that people have, like, right. well, what else do I put my identity in? Right, right. No, I think that's a very good point. I'll talk to you about that. Well, we have a question right at the, the sorry, at the back. Hi. Uh, I'm Gabe Jack. I'm to the business school here in LA. But a town I'm a very angry citizen. So, um, <laughs> I have a question for you. Come to the right place. <laughs> I have a question for you that's about um, given the work that you've done and how you've seen people react to good journalism and bad journalism and just different ideas that challenge them in, in general. Um, first, first part is, what do you recommend for young people in terms of how they spend their time advocating uh, for things they believe? I'm, uh, I think there may be some benefits when we lose a bunch of people at some point, right? Because uh, there are just some intractable people. Um, so I'm asking, how should they spend their time, who should they spend their time advocating things with? There's a lot of disturbing research about tribalism and how entrenched people are in their views after very early on in life. And from the work you've done, just in terms of the return on investment for their time, how do you think they are more likely to get people mobilized for causes they care about? Is it trying to change the ideas of people in midlife and older, or, or regardless of age, people who at least show some openness to their idea? Is it really worth engaging in these angry Thanksgiving dinner debates with uncles? <laughs> <laughs> is it worth spending all the energy on that, or is it much better use of time focusing on people who seem a little bit more open, or even more apathetic, who aren't so entrenched in perspective? And the next part, real quick, is related to that, what do you recommend in terms of where they turn for their information? Do you think there is any hope for still paying attention to a CNN or an MSNBC or supposedly left-leaning networks? Or do you recommend they just ditch it all, go to democracy now, go <laughs> common trains, go independent media? Great, Should we take another question? Yes, Julian. Yeah. Uh, I want to know, so this is good because it sort of relates, but not entirely. So I'm sort of wondering if this problem we have in the US with the media is something that we're seeing across the global north, the Anglophone world, and the west, or if it's something that is really uniquely an American thing. And assuming that I think, I think many European countries right now have this problem, I'd like to know how this problem is manifesting in other European countries, for example, the UK, France, even, I don't know, Germany. Mm -hmm. So that's a very good question. Um, so to, to your um, question um, at the back, what should young, to whom should young people be directing their advocacy? You know, I mean, everyone in their midst, I guess. I don't know about Thanksgiving dinners, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I mean, when, when you're young, you inhabit a social world. It is, I think, if one is even vaguely socially, politically minded, uh, one in a sense can't help but be what could be perceived as proselytizing, right? Because what does one do? And once you, when you exchange ideas, then you try to persuade others of your... I mean, a lot of my political conscientization happened uh, with my peers. My peers telling me various things that I didn't know or understand, and then me telling them various things the way that I... And then one's thing is, is formed, and then one goes about doing whatever one does in the world. But I, I, I don't think, in a, in a way, I don't think it's a choice. The choice that's made is made by extraordinary people like these young kids. 
uh, this Greta uh, on her own, um, well, I mean, and then now joined by all these people, and then that, that came out of this massive, or a series of massive catastrophes in the U.S., which are these, these series of school <coughs> shootings that have somehow mobilized people. And you know, this, um, I was at a dinner a couple of weeks ago in New York, and this guy who's a psychoanalyst, in fact, he said uh, he's really worried about Greta, right, because she's so young, she's a young person who has all this responsibility on her shoulders, and who knows how this will be. And I think, yeah, that's absolutely right, but just think, I immediately thought, who who do you immediately think of as a young woman who has been catapulted to this global fame uh, for some cause? Well, the person I thought of, number one, is Malala Yousafzai, mm -hmm. the Pakistani, young Pakistani woman, mm -hmm. and Nadia Murad, who was uh, a, a Yazdi woman who was kept in ISIS captivity, brutally raped, blah, 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 and, then, and now has become the spokesperson. She just won the Nobel Prize last year. And they're all roughly the same age. So, I mean, it's not to compare, you know, suffering and so on, but really in the grand scheme of things, Greta has it pretty good. Um, but all these, these young people who've taken on, they've all come out of extraordinary circumstances, right? But for us mere mortals, um, I just think whatever, whoever is in, one, uh, in one's midst, and I do think actually even with, with older people, if one has the uh, chutzpah, one should develop persuasive arguments for whatever it is that one's position is. Do you want to come to my hearing? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I just I want should. to add here that for the, if you want to direct young people to indie media websites and platforms, go to our website, park in, park in the media <laughs> and we have a long list of our texts. So please be as frequently as possible. <laughs> Promotion is always important, right? <laughs> okay. and, and for the second point, I think people should, it's not just about going to whatever see, you can of course watch CNN, watch MSNBC, watch Democracy Now!, go to Park Indy Media, find more. I don't think there's any limit or any constraint on what one should read or watch or, you know, it's like at a certain point, I think it, what's, I, I think is the most important is to develop a critical sensibility. And I think that, I mean, that's a much broader problem of what's wrong with education, da, 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 et cetera. Um, but I think that's the real faculty that is absolutely necessary to engage at any level, intellectually, politically, socially, in the world, is to be able to think critically, which is to say one thinks um, for oneself and doesn't take everything that's said as self-evidently true. Um, about the, the, the media, yeah, absolutely. It's not just in the US at all, I think it's, and it's not just in uh, Western Europe or North America. In fact, as we well know from South Asia, it's um, all over the planet, and it's just gruesome. It's horrific. I mean, now, as you know, Raza, in India and in Pakistan, um, there's, I mean, first of all, the worst thing in the world that's happened, in my very humble opinion, is this 24-hour news. I just, I find it, it's just such a bizarre phenomenon, and it's now, rather than diminishing in places, it's multiplied, and there are a million channels everywhere you go in the world and they run non-stop, non-stop, non-stop. So you constantly have to say something. I mean, 20, I mean, we do an hour's show. Dude, it's a lot. I mean, it's not a lot, but you know, it's, it's a lot of work goes into producing one hour of live television. These people do 24 hours. So of course, that relies also on enormous amounts of corporate funding. It, to get viewers relies on all kinds of sensational antics and anchors and guests and so it's very disturbing and what kind of information is imparted in those discussions not not very much so it's true that there are still in the places that you listed at least to my knowledge in, in England and Germany they do have um, publicly funded uh, yeah. uh, television uh, and radio very good publicly funded television and radio um, but that's sadly not true in, in most places. So these corporate media outlets have taken over entirely. Uh, well, you had a question, yes. No. So yeah, I mean, it, it is connected to the media. Um, 
And I wanted to question kind of your ideology around um, honesty and truthfulness in the media. Mm -hmm. And more so question whether you think that is even a reality at this point. I mean, we are, we're living in a time of swiping and stimulation. And we swipe through our Facebook feeds and our Instagrams to look for <coughs> quick headlines and news stories. But is this generation, are the youth really looking for depth, honesty, and facts? Or is this a generation of headlines, swiping, scrolling, and being, I mean, our, our <laughs> timelines are completely polarized to our to our political standings. We see what we want to see. So is, is truth and honesty even relevant at this point, or do we need to rethink the media, restructure the media, and make it more fitting for our time? And That's now an you, excellent question. Yes, very good excellent question. Excellent question. And thanks for covering this, Sheikh. Uh, my name is Michael Mulvey. I'm in the politics Thank department, you. and I'm studying politics and media and the geriatric undergrad here. Um, and I just... And thank you for contributing to my education these many years with your work at Democracy Now! Thank you. Um, so earlier in your remarks, you, uh, you had mentioned um, uh, something to the effect of the media being implicated or embedded in the government and the market. And so along the lines of following up on that, um, with the present model of uh, globalization and um, you know a colonial uh, extension of powers uh, in their present model um, and the United States being situated as the largest economy with the most powerful military, I have to just go back and ask what did people people think would happen after the Supreme Court uh, gave us the uh, Wisconsin right to life and then the um, Citizens United. It's basically putting a first set aside on uh, the American government. And then ha with all of this wealth at the uh, feet of mainstream media now with our political process, how can independent media, how can anybody, um, this is an intractable problem, how can we roll back this uh, uh, giving of license and, and tremendous wealth to uh, a monotone megaphone media? Uh, what can the independent media do to, to, to bring us back to a place where we can reclaim our discourse. Very good. And um, before you uh, answer, I, I just want to say the next round of questions would be from women. So no more questions for men for at least two. So please be prepared. Okay. <laughs> um, swiping stimulation. <clears throat> You're absolutely right. I, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> how one should um, think not only about the media, but to think, and you would be able to tell us more, uh, what to think of, how to think of what it means to inhabit a society like that, right? A society which is increasingly geared towards um, the ephemeral, uh, and that uh, produces as a manner at a you know as a manner of course in a manner of course constant uh, multiple stimuli so your attention your thing is con is constantly shifting uh, and, and your mind is being stimulated and taken constantly being taken away from everything mm -hmm. right I, I, to me, I find it extremely depressing, and I have all kinds of apocalyptic thoughts, which I will not share this evening, <laughs> um, in the interest of maintaining the illusion of hope. Um, <laughs> um, Timelines. Yes, it's true. And of course, you're absolutely right that, that everybody watches and reads, etc., whatever is on Twitter and on Facebook and whatever other things. Uh, so if one is to rethink the media, I don't know, again, I can only say that I think um, independent media, and I don't necessarily mean only the, the place where I work, but in general, uh, I think that is, uh, even though it's extremely, um, in a way, uh, relies on older forms, I think what a lot of independent media are doing to try to cater to this new way of being, learning, disseminating information, 
is you know whatever now even we put out like little clips on Twitter which are like two minutes and you know there's another kind of content that's given to uh, Instagram and to all of these different social media things in the hope that younger people will have the the uh, not just younger people of course because now even older people have the same problem with attention um, will have the, the the focus to be able to to at least watch 30 seconds on Yemen if even if they can't watch like certainly not a we do 15 20 minute segments like people want to die by the end it's like basically like five years <laughs> in the present time right? it's a 15 20 minute segment um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't know, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, as for the question about... Um, Restructuring wealth, to take back the discourse, right? Wealth yes. and corporations and media. You know, I think it is a, a kind of, um, it's a difficult one. Uh, you know, independent media everywhere is, uh, you know, they're having a hard go, we just talked about uh, how this is true in many different places in the world, not just here. But the one thing that is happening, actually, uh, at the same time, in these places, is another thing that young people are doing. I mean, just now when I was in Mahar, right, those people at Dawn News, they're starting that. So I, I was just in Pakistan uh, for a, 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 a different kind of conference earlier this year. And these young people who work for one of the English dailies there, um, and they must have been, whatever, just out of uh, college. They said that they, they are starting this thing, which is independent of the main outlet, and it's gonna be, it's gonna be independent, they're gonna do interviews, they're gonna do whatever, produce their own content, uh, work as reporters, because they feel that what the, ma what the, the mainstream is producing is, uh, makes absolutely no sense and is not covering in any way the critical issues that Pakistan is facing. So, and that's just one example, a very recent one that I have myself experience of, but there are countless like this of independent media outlets, uh, you know, growing in various places around the world. Now, of course, it's like, you know, David Goliath kind of problem. <laughs> it's not like, you know, that's not going to be somehow overturned by this in this particular context, but nevertheless, one can try. Uh, I'd like to add a little bit. I think uh, what Nermeen uh, earlier mentioned as the first of the points on uh, wealth inequality, I think it's kind of linked to that because the kind of media concentration you have in the US and in many big countries is simply unacceptable. And that is because there are the antitrust laws and the antitrust uh, legislation and control of monopolies and oligarchies has broken down globally. <coughs> That is how you amass such vulgar amounts of wealth. And uh, that is what people have to resist. So until you don't break down the big monopolies and, and you don't break down mass concentration uh, of wealth and uh, of media tycoons, this restructuring dream is not going to come about. That's my view. Of course, I'm, I've taken the, the liberty. So we, uh, yes, there, there we have two young women. So. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, it's you. Go on. Yeah. Sabeda. Hi, I'm Sabeda. I'm a senior journalism and Spanish student here. Thank you for coming. I really Thank you for coming. Um, my question was about objectivity, what your thoughts are. Is it real? Um, do, you, do you practice objectivity? Um, Good. Okay, and the second question? Yes, your name? Go on. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm a. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alora. I'm also a journalism student. Here. Sorry, what's your name? Alora. Alora. Yeah. Um, so I'm also having a question about objectivity. I feel a lot of time, the person that we're taught in the journalism department is about objectivity, and if you're not objective, um, then you have a bias, and having a bias is not good because then you're all, you have to tell both sides of the story. So. My question is, should objectivity be one of the first things that we're taught as journalists when coming into um, like our field of study, or if not, like what should it be? Um, thank you, Zubeda and Alora, for those questions. I, uh, you know, I do think, and I, I have to say, I must really stress this at the present moment, 
I mean, there is such a thing as a fact, and there is such a thing as a truth. And to the extent that we uh, are able to, we should make every effort possible to get to the truth and the facts. So, I mean, obviously, in a very simple way, uh, I cannot say that there are four people in this room. Okay, so that's a very, very simple example. At the same time, uh, what that in itself is, in that is a very minimum, okay, the very, very minimum that one must do. That isn't sufficient, I don't think, um, to be a good journalist. I think one also, again, has to have some kind of critical sensibility and also look where people aren't looking. I mean, you can't just go into, you know, where everybody's giving interviews and everybody's giving you all the information. You go and you write all of that down and then you report it. That's not reporting. I mean, then you're just basically, you're just a mouthpiece um, for whoever is willing to speak to you. So that's not really the point either. Um, so I think the, the, the crucial thing, which I think, you know, democracy now, it, it, it's such a fabulous place for this reason. We're absolutely adamant um, that we get all the facts right. But what we try to do is find people um, who other people aren't speaking to, um, you know, people whose voices, opinions, thoughts, experiences are not considered important enough. Whereas for us, I think it's very important to look at the people who are um, who are not necessarily, as they say on, you know, whatever, the expert on this, who don't have 58 degrees and whatever they're being asked to comment on, but whose lived experience is about something that's occurred, right? So you don't, they don't need, they should have the opportunity to speak because they can tell us, the audiences, the world, something that we'll never know otherwise, no matter how many books we read and no matter how many, and that, I think, is an absolutely crucial component. Yes. People need to be involved and not, you know, and, and everyone to the extent that that's possible. And lastly, I think it's very important to, uh, you know, this David Goliath story, whatever. You know, you have to always ask the underdogs also, no? Like, what's going on? How's this working out for you kind of thing? You know, it's just like you can't just assume that what the person in power is telling you is the whole truth, right? There's always a little more, and one should always try to get more and more, rather than just go with the, the one, just because it's making the most noise, or it's the most, in some sense, uh, uh, available. I don't know if that answers your uh, question. I'll come to you later. Uh, other, yes, uh, we have a, yes, please. Hi, I'm Clarily, I'm also a journalism student here at IC, and I wanted to go back to what you said about issues in education, and with that, I know that Democracy Now! has a lot of media literacy, like lessons that they'll go to school and like teach kids about media. And I was wondering what the reception of that is and if there's been any sort of a push to teaching media in public schools. And if so, what the most important thing we should be teaching kids at a young age so they can become critical media consumers. Okay, okay one more. We have room for one more. Okay, yes, please. I um, would like to know your opinion or your critique of the Christian Science Monitor because that is uh, a, a source of news for me, and I've thought of it as independent journalism, but sometimes I've gone, well, wait a minute, that's strongly influenced by the Christian Science Church, but that's not how they report in my mind. And I was wondering, I know that on Democracy Now!, I think a couple of times I've heard you guys even quote Christian Science Monitor, so I'd like for you to comment on that model of journalism. Okay, so let me just respond to that question first. Yeah, because I think, I, I mean, uh, Christian Science Monitor is a very good newspaper. I don't, I mean, it's like saying, you know, everybody, uh, if you look hard enough, I mean, even the, the Wall Street Journal, people say, oh, conservative, but they're excellent reporters. The Wall Street Journal has excellent reporters. Some of their opinion pieces, obviously, are less <coughs> to my uh, liking, let's say, uh, but their reporting is superb. And Christian Science Monitor, I, I, I'm afraid I, I don't read it now, but I did. I read it for many, many years. Uh, I, I see no, um, there's nothing that I could say about it that's in any way uh, uh, critical. Um, there are, again, in every publication of every kind, uh, there are things that one will think, mm, 
you know, but that's good. One should think. You know? <laughs> uh, and so on media literacy, you know what we do actually, and if you guys ever come to the city, you should definitely get in touch. What we do is a Democracy Now! has an extremely active, robust uh, program uh, whereby at the end of every broadcast, for every, almost every broadcast, there is a class of students that comes from somewhere. So they're graduate students, they're undergraduate students, they're high school students, they're even middle school students. Um, they come, they watch the live broadcast, and after the broadcast we come out, you know, they get a tour of the studio, and then we speak to them. And these are the students who come, some of them, the older ones, are, are journalism students, but by no means are they all, uh, always, the very, a very small minority are journalism or media students. So again, uh, you know, and that's a very interesting and good experience because whatever they ask a lot of questions, uh, uh, we also get to learn, you know, what is it that they're thinking, what kinds of things are they reading, watching, seeing. Uh, but I think, you know, critical media, how to become a critical media consumer is to become a critical thinker. You know what I'm saying? So it's not anything that's geared specifically to the media. It's just about learning to think. Learning to actually just learning to think. Period. So you just think. Uh, you know, don't you don't just go along with whatever in any context at any time. Uh, even when one reads, I don't know, one reads literature. One reads. It's cultivating a form of um, of reflection and. Uh, Criticism, but I don't mean criticism in the sense of you know like you suck kind of thing. But I mean criticism in the sense of uh, yeah, a, a, a critical sensibility where one interrogates in one's mind what one is seeing, reading, thinking, you know, etc. Right. You had a follow-up question. Oh, I did. Uh, I wouldn't say a follow-up question. Okay. Um, a whole other question. A whole other question. <laughs> So uh, this is actually regarding your commentary on kind of like repressed demographics that don't always have a voice in our when society. When I was responding to yeah, 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 yeah. And so I was just kind of curious about that because we're in a very educated room of well-off people. And so mm -hmm. I'm just kind of interested in seeing how you and Democracy Now! are actively trying to hear from these repressed um, demographics of people and or if it if you said that to just kind of sound good or <laughs> no no look no you can't say that no I mean democracy now of course you can say whatever you'd like to say <laughs> <laughs> democracy right we have I mean first of all democracy now is open to everybody I mean if any for example just from what I was saying earlier schools colleges it's by no means just rich kids mm -hmm. colleges schools etc that come so there are uh, people actively in democracy now that are from less heard of democracy oh you, sorry are you asking are there people who work at democracy now who are from or participate in the conversations come to the coverage talk, kind of like, yeah uh, you think about, about, you mean, about the coverage of yeah um, underprivileged Yes, I mean, I don't know. Yes, I mean, it's certainly my sense that that's what we do. Yeah, we try to constantly, even when we're when we were talking about earlier, about getting, you know, what is it, objectivity, etc. It's constantly <coughs> trying to bring in voices that are not being represented mm -hmm. elsewhere. And who are those voices that are not being represented elsewhere? Well, they tend to be, you know, people who aren't, uh, uh, you know, powerful in many different ways. So it's always our attempt. We don't always succeed, obviously, but it's our attempt constantly to, to go exactly where, uh, you know, as Amy Goodman, our, our host, where the silences are. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously, we could always do more, as indeed everyone could, but that's certainly our attempt in all of our coverage. I think one example that you could <laughs> cite here is the coverage of immigrants and refugees and migrants. So often in mainstream media, you would not hear their voices. You would hear voices of either government authorities, experts, but the people who are actually living through that particular moment and experience, they don't get their due coverage. And I think democracy now differs 
from the mainstream that it brings forward. And even to today, I, I didn't watch the show t for various reasons, whatever. But we did a, a show today on um, homelessness I in saw that. San it Francisco. Really, good. really had to work out. Very good. I have to watch it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was somebody who had been formerly homeless. Yeah, that's right. Spoke and somebody and else who worked. I think that's the right. This woman who works on this coalition of homelessness. So. Yeah. So you know, it's like how many times on. It's not my sense that in other media you'd often hear from someone, you know, people who are at that level of dispossession. I mean, the guy, uh, you know, so we do try. It's, it's not always a successful attempt, but we do. Cool. Other questions? We have a few minutes left. Yes, please. Um, hi, I'm Gabe. I'm a television radio major. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that a person or a group of people's uh, views can become so abhorrent that we shouldn't even bother engaging with them? <laughs> Are you asking me personally? Or like, well, like, as a, like as a a society as a whole, like people who engage in uh, journalism and media and asking questions and um, being critical and uh, engaging in discussions with others, should we like completely write off people that we think like have really important views, like people who think that like pedophilia should be included as like a sexual orientation? Or, you know. That should be included as a sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. There are people that believe that. Huh? I'm not sure how one would how would one even begin that conversation. <laughs> I don't. You know, that's a very that's a very uh, difficult question. Um, and, and of course, the example that you cite as such, you know, if one were going to say, you know, someone is extremely right wing and extreme, someone is like radical left wing, and then so should one. But now this kind of thing is a real pedophilia as a sexual orientation. I don't know. I mean, I suppose in some cases where something is so egregious, I don't think they should be written off. But one should, I guess, come extremely well prepared with an argument for why their position is one that, you know, shouldn't be engaged with, uh, or try in vain, I guess, to persuade them otherwise. I don't know. What, what's your sense? Oh, uh, I don't, I don't uh, think people that hold such egregious views should be written off completely. Yeah. But there are some, I feel like people who hold the most egregious views are the ones that are most stuck in their ways. Uh. And sometimes they're the most difficult and so it's easier to give up with those people. Right. I see what you're saying. Right. Mm. Okay. There are two more hands. So are you done with this answer? Yeah, I think yes, I'm sorry. Please, <laughs> please, <laughs> please, please, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a slight follow up to the New York Times profile a white supremacist and the lead in is like so and so is just Richard Spencer is just like anyone else walking through. You know, they they start to profile of him walking through a grocery store like you or I might. Um, but like, should his views be treated in the New York Times in that same way, or should they like, should they approach it as holding him to account as the first thing rather than profiling him as the first? Um, well, you know, I think so. This is a is a I don't. It's a very good question. But for me, it's an easier question to answer because I. I do think that it's a problem to simply make people into monsters, you know, to immediately say, well, what this person is reducible to is this thing that they've said or done, da da da. Um, so no, I think in that sense, no, you make a profile of these people and you don't uh, immediately. I mean, and this goes equally for, for everybody. I don't know, a murderer, a rapist, a suicide bomber, a mass shooter. I don't know, because if one is to, in any sense, try to, I, I don't even know if understand is the, the word, but to engage with a human being who has come to have these views or take these actions, one can't just condemn them as somehow, I don't know. Monstrous objects. Yeah, so, no. Oh. Second, yeah. Yeah, I want to ask the same question the third time. Oh, please. Uh, because okay. I think it's important that it's been unanswered. So let me just give two examples of completely egregious, ideologically based views that uh, sort of got smacked, uh, uh, smacked me because I didn't realize just how ideologically committed people were to the abhorrent views. Uh, Bolsonaro, for example, 
uh, feels that um, you know the <coughs> interests of uh, uh, development far outshadow the interests of uh, say uh, indigenous peoples, and uh, he actively supports <coughs> the squelching, suppressing, uh, ethnic cleansing. Uh, you could say genocide in some instances. Yes. They've killed maybe a thousand journalists, and what, that's one. An even more extreme example, of, well, there's two. One is um, um, that Steve Bannon fellow, he, he believes, and he's published it, that uh, there's going to be some apocalyptic war between the US and China. And because of that, um, we have to uh, deliberately suppress multiculturalism and just get rid of the indigenous people because you have to clear the decks for action for this big war between uh, capitalist liberal democracies and say China and the authoritarian and whatever it is it's, it's more than just a naive person, your uncle of Thanksgiving thinking one thing or another, it's somebody who has a firm, fixed view. And the last example, the most respected, is uh, the <coughs> economist um, Friedman. He passed away now. He felt that perfect democracy came with spending a dollar because it was decentralized and you could spend it or you could not spend it. And that uh, electoral <coughs> democracy was just the losers trying to get uh, something for nothing, a second bite at the apple. The, the real democracy was the democracy of the top. So you get these bizarre views, or to me at least, bizarre views, and for the first couple of days you just can't believe that people think that. And then uh, you look around for other allies, but then most other people don't think that anybody thinks that. So, in other words, my question is sort of a Chomsky question. He says, well, there's a kind of conspiracy of stupidity or something, to take the benign view of it. And, and people are actively planning these kinds of ways to suppress the, the great mass of the people. And what I naively thought, not as a political person, was, oh, no, they're just confused or something like that. What do you feel? You've been in the field you know, for a, a long time. I'm not sure I understand the question. It's whether people like Bolsonaro, Bannon, and Friedman are people who should be engaged with, irrespective of their Well, views. they're human beings. Yes. I mean, Bolsonaro's father was a minor yes, at yes. Serra Palata. So, you yes. know, they're, they're, they've been hurt. But, uh, but uh, I don't know. You can say engage with them, but it's more than just. No, look. Also, these people fit into. I mean, at least the example that you gave about Bolsonaro. It's not to you know excuse anything, <coughs> but you know this whole thing of development. It's not something that uh, is unique by any means to Brazil. Uh, this is a logic that was spread the all Niger, over Peru, the Congo. Sure. I mean, all over the third world, United the States. global south. <laughs> right. people were. There were indigenous communities that were wiped out, displaced, and that's still ongoing. It's not like that was then. That was his argument. Kind of we forest Germany. Right. So it's. I mean. So that's that. In a sense, that phenomenon, and in a way, I guess all of them, Bannon, Bolsonaro, that that's symptomatic of something else. It's a much larger. It's not reducible to the individual. There's much more that's going on together with it. So obviously, I mean, the question, what, what. Your question is different from the ones that preceded it because you're saying, well, what does one do with people who have, uh, you know, who assume these kinds of positions and already have such enormous power, right? As opposed to just thinking, well, someone has to direct it against most people. Right. Well, yes, that's a very, very big. Uh, that's a very big uh, difference, and it's it's a big problem. Now, the only way in which, at least as a journalist, I imagine. Uh, or a writer is to uh, hold them to account. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, uh, if I ever had the opportunity to interview Bolsonaro, I certainly would. So there's no question. Uh, and even, and Bannon. 
Yeah. In fact, I would love to interview him. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, I, 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 think the, I think the problem really is yeah. the amplification of dangerous views such as racism, fascism, mm -hmm. that goes on when, as you cited, Narmeen, in your speech, uh, in your remarks, that the number of minutes that uh, oh, right. the one who shall, who shall not be named <laughs> got compared to all others put together. It is that the problem with the mainstream framing mm -hmm. and programming that you get dangerous views amplified, normalized. Mm -hmm. So, and talking about mass shooters, they're always lonely. They've always had no friends. They always deserve our, our sympathy. And if, and if they happen to be of the wrong color or wrong ethnic lineage, mm. then they're dangerous wild monsters to be immediately locked away and put away for, for years. So, so there are very serious issues with media framing. Mm -hmm. I think we are almost out of time. If there's any last pressing question, uh, Pressing question. Uh, okay, well, well, I have to give, I have to give preference to my student, uh, and who's also happens to be a woman. So. Hi, I'm Chrissy. Hello, Chrissy. I'm a journalism and environmental studies major here at IC. Um, my question is actually kind of a generational question based on social media. One of the first things we're taught in um, journalism school is essentially go back and erase all your social media accounts. Yet we're the first generation to have grown up with these accounts. We see it as part of our identity, which is really unfortunate. Sorry, what is part of your identity? <coughs> the social media yeah. aspect of our lives. Uh -huh. The Twitter accounts, the Instagram accounts, even the Facebook accounts that half of us probably don't use anymore. Because um, that's for people like us all <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that, I know. Um, basically, what advice would you give to younger generational journalists who are, work who are about to enter that workforce and are being told, you know, you can't have a personality on social media, you know, everything you post has to have this objective side to it. Oh. Oh, so that's what you're to, you're not told that social media in and of itself is a bad idea because it destroys all no. possibilities of attention, focus, thought. <laughs> 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 See, what, what you're saying is that it's that you're told that you have to you have to make sure that your feed is kind of sanitized, you're not like super like, I see, yes. I see. Uh, what do I think of that? What's the harm in doing that? I mean, is there a reason not, to, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it won't last anyway, right? Because the minute you're actually a journalist, you'll be giving all of your opinions and posting all kinds of things mm -hmm. that you agree with or don't just don't agree with and then there'll be endless Twitter arguments <laughs> which will like disappear in like five seconds and somehow you'll have wasted three hours having an argument <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing is so bizarre. <laughs> I really don't get it, but it's probably because I'm too old to understand. <laughs> Because we value our community very much. So, um, yes, yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, Jamal Khashoggi. <coughs> He's uh, obviously a high-profile journalist who was murdered. <coughs> but uh, Demac Chanel chronicles a lot of low-profile mm -hmm. journalists who've been murdered. Absolutely. And I'm just wondering um, if. Uh, you can, if you have, a, if there's a sense of maybe the world being a different place, if some of the truth was let out because they were allowed to live. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true not just of journalists. I mean, it's certainly true of journalists, but I think it's not just true of journalists. There are a lot of activists also. There are a lot of people in education. I mean, all these people in various places at various times face all kinds of. Um, threats and uh, the absence of those voices there's always there are huge costs associated with it absolutely well that should bring <laughs> our evening <laughs> 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 uh, acknowledge my wonderful colleagues especially Brandy Holly who's right at the back <laughs> I all got the credit, and then our wonderful student assistant, Mathilde, who is there. <laughs> Julian, Julian, and Harrison. So, uh, 
uh, they all help us put together the, these events and other stuff that we do. And we hope to see you. Our next event is scheduled for October the 22nd, which is a talk by Todd Miller, uh, who will be at IC. Uh, I think it will be the same place, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, you will get a notification. So do come. Thank you.